Welcome to our ninth and final segment of the series of Sound Mind, which focuses on healthy cognitive aging and dementia among older adults. It is sponsored by the Stanford Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. Our focus in this segment is on the family members. It's on family caregiving. It may interest our audience to know that in 2016, approximately 5 million Americans suffered from Alzheimer's disease or another form of dementia. And they were cared for by about 16 million family members or friends who provide, generally speaking, unpaid care to those individuals. And the estimates, according to the recent facts and figures published by the Alzheimer's Association early this year, says that about 18 billion hours of care were provided by these individuals. And if you do the math, that comes out to maybe 1,200 hours of care per person per year, which would clearly bankrupt the country if we had to pay for that care. So caregivers are very important, and that's why we're devoting this segment to that topic. And in this segment, we're going to talk about what caregivers experience, some of the negative and positive impacts, and from a personal perspective, what it's like to be a caregiver. So we are uh, joined by two very important guests tonight. I am your host, uh, Dolores Gallagher-Thompson. I'm a psychologist and a research professor at Stanford University School of Medicine. Uh, my husband and colleague and research partner for many years is Larry Wolford Thompson. <clears throat> he has studied dementia caregiving for over 20 years and worked clinically with patients and their families. Uh, Larry is particularly interested in applying cognitive behavior therapy and principles and techniques to reduce depression in family caregivers. And uh, he's very uh, interested in seeing what can happen with smartphone apps and things like that in this digital age. How can we make more information and services available to caregivers at a reasonable or virtually no cost? And he and I together developed a program called Coping with Caregiving that you're going to hear more about. Um, it's been successfully used in this country as well as in Spain, Australia, and Hong Kong. So uh, I'm sure that he will give you some more details about it later on. And our other guest is Selena Rodriguez. Selena is a journalist and radio personality who has her own radio show. She was born in Mexico and has lived in the Bay Area for three decades. She has generously agreed to share with us her personal experiences of caring for her father, who was diagnosed with dementia at the age of 74. But before we turn to our guests, I would like to give some context for this discussion of caregiving. And I'd like to start by saying, what do we mean when we use the term caregiver? So generally, we mean a family member or close friend who provides assistance above and beyond what's typical in a family setting. So this assistance in the beginning might be helping the person remember to take their medications, uh, helping them get to appointments on time, helping them manage their daily affairs. And then as the dementias progress, usually personal care is needed. And because of this, there tends to be a fair amount of stress and strain on the caregiver, particularly as the dementias advance. The other point I'd like to make is who is the typical caregiver? So for the most part, caregiving is a woman's profession. The majority of caregivers, two thirds, are either daughters or daughters-in-law caring for an aging parent or wives caring for a disabled spouse. And uh, they are individuals who often 
have other responsibilities outside the home in addition to what they do for caregiving. So many have young children in the home. They work outside. They may lose time from work because of their caregiving responsibilities. So caregiving is expensive, time-consuming, and takes its toll. So uh, with that backdrop, I hope that we can turn to Dr. Thompson and ask him to tell us about what do we know of, of the impact of caregiving on the family caregiver? Well, the caregiving, as you point out, is an extremely stressful situation, and it results in a number of symptoms that people have that can be categorized uh, very easily or roughly into physiological and psychological mm -hmm. symptoms. Mm -hmm. And in the physiological, you see problems with the compromised immune function. You see tremendous uh, variations or oscillations in the blood pressure and cardiovascular system. And hormonally, you see tremendous disruptions in the uh, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, which results in uh, uh, too much cortisol being into the system and it's not going through its usual diurnal variation as it should. And these, these types of physiological changes make the individual very susceptible to catch serious diseases mm -hmm. and uh, also to see d disruptions in the functioning in ways that m major disorders can occur if mm -hmm. they do not get appropriate attention. Mm -hmm. So. So physically, some caregivers may become actually um, ill or, or more yeah. prone to different kinds of yes, illnesses. Yes, you're right, you're right. Yeah. And then on and the, then psychologically? In the psychological picture, we have depression is a very important mm -hmm. uh, feature here. And on the heels mm -hmm. of depression, you have anxiety. People are having trouble um, knowing what's going to happen and will I be able to cope with it. And then... Clearly, frustration and anger comes into the picture when things don't go right and mm -hmm. things are uh, uh, messing up. And then that's usually followed uh, often by a certain amount of guilt about what's going mm -hmm. on, and, and particularly if the mm -hmm. caregiver gets angry with, the, with their loved one and then they feel guilty about that or things that they didn't do. So there mm -hmm. are those factors that need that are very negative and cause a lot of dysfunction as well. Mm -hmm. Well, is it all negative though? Has the research shown anything else in the picture for many caregivers? Well, no, that's a, that's a good question. There, many caregivers actually uh, use this, uh, use the positive to help them deal with, with uh, caregiving. They get uh, a lot of a sense of giving back to the individual. You hear things like, you know, he helped me so much in my life, now it's my turn, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. So it's very rewarding and meaningful them, to them to be able to give and help an individual like this. Mm -hmm. And they develop um, a certain amount of gratitude and thankfulness mm -hmm. as they have these kinds of thoughts, which uh, we know it's very, very helpful in warding off or counteracting mm -hmm. a lot of the negative ideas and feelings that they have. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like caregiving is kind of a complex picture. You have the positives, you have some of the negatives. So do, does this change over time? Like in the beginning, is it different than it is later on? the longer you've been a caregiver? It does change over time. Uh, and usually uh, in the early stages, there's a, a wonderment, a questioning what's going on here. And there's a, a very, a lot of tension about that. And, and, uh, and the people are afraid. And then the care increases in terms of the amount of care needed. And then they began to see that this is kind of hopeless and it's not going to work out and they get depressed, more and more depressed and because of the tremendous work and the fact that they're seeing their loved one just disappear right in front mm -hmm. of them and there's mm -hmm. nothing they can do about it. Mm -hmm. And then later on in the process when the, the self really begins to disappear from the body, there is a kind of a... a an acceptance of what's going on in a way and, and that they can deal with it in a slightly different way 
and, and also the care is much less as the individual gets old because they're less agitated, they sit more, they sleep more, they don't require a lot of the supervision that they did early on. So there are uh, uh, general changes across the course mm -hmm. of caregiving. Mm -hmm. So I would imagine then that uh, caregivers uh, go through many ups and downs in yes. their experiences. Yes, you're, you're very yeah. right about that. Yeah. So I, I think that it would be really good now to hear from mm -hmm. Selena, who will share with us her personal experiences. Would you agree that caregiving has many ups and downs? You know, as uh, okay. Dr. Thompson was describing all the different stages of this situation, I was, uh, it remember me, it re all the struggles that we went through in our family. Mm -hmm. uh, my dad, he was a very brilliant man, a forest engineer. He got mm -hmm. twice the National Forestry Award in mm -hmm. Mexico. So we were used to these very bright men, very active, mm -hmm. very independent. And as we started noticing that he had some problems, some trouble speaking mm -hmm. and uh, not coordinating the language very well as he used to, he was a very eloquent man. Mm -hmm. uh, we said, what's going on? And I remember one time my mom shared, you know, Celie, I don't know what's going on, but we're having so many arguments mm -hmm. I don't understand and he was starting to go through these different stages and changes in him, mm -hmm. his personality so it was emotionally draining mm -hmm. devastating to see how he was going down the uh, the ladder mm -hmm. and there was nothing we could do and especially for my mom she just consumed herself mm -hmm. uh, she started to have emphysema mm -hmm. that she didn't care about mm -hmm. and uh, if you look at her pictures right after our dad passed away, she aged so much, mm -hmm. you know? So it was emotionally draining, mm -hmm. physically draining. Sometimes he would get up at night, he wanted to wander around. Mm -hmm. A couple of times he wanted to walk away from the apartment where they used to live in Mexico City. Thank God there were these people at the entrance that said, where are you going? What do you need? And they called up my mom. So it's devastating emotionally and physically devastating. Mm -hmm. What would you say were some of the most challenging things that you that you had to deal with as the daughter? Uh, not trying to sh uh, show him support for him, trying mm -hmm. to support him, trying to let him know that everything was going to be okay, mm -hmm. that we loved him mm -hmm. no matter what. He was our dad. He was, the, I mean, our yeah. best dad no matter what. And uh, and trying to to control the feelings, especially we didn't have that much information at mm -hmm. that time. Mm -hmm. There was no, or if there was, we didn't know that there was an Al Alzheimer's association, like mm -hmm. there is here. So all the resources, all the support groups that you can call to or call in for mm -hmm. for help, we didn't have that. Uh, the doctor mentioned a book when the day has more than 36 yeah. hours yes, that yes. really helped yes. us a lot mm -hmm. to more or less understand what was happening, mm -hmm. what was coming up. And mm -hmm. it described exactly all the different stages that our dad went through. Mm -hmm. And so that helped us a little bit more to cope with all the emotional stress and the mm -hmm. physical stress. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it was, it was very, very... Uh, very hard to see, mm -hmm. to yes. see that. Yes, it mm -hmm. certainly is. Um, yes. How long did did it go on? It went, he was uh, diagnosed with uh, dementia about four or five years before he mm -hmm. passed away. Mm -hmm. So he, he, it was like about four years after he retired. Mm -hmm. He was very active and he said, mm -hmm. okay, once I retire, I'm going mm -hmm. to learn English, I'm yes. going to travel, yeah. your mom and I are going mm -hmm. to do this and that. Mm -hmm. They never did, mm -hmm. you know, it's amazing. Yes. They never did. So I think this change from being extremely active to almost doing nothing mm -hmm. was very hard on him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like some of the negative things that Larry described yes. were things that you experienced. So Definitely. <laughs> like I said, he, you just took, took me by the hand and, mm -hmm. and, and remind me all the painful stages that our family went through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with his dementia. Yeah, 
Well, Larry also mentioned the positive aspects, so mm -hmm. I'm wondering, were there other things or ways that the family coped that maybe helped you to have a balanced, you know, a little bit more balanced experience, uh, the positive and the negative? Uh, yeah, um, I had a chance to be with him for his last two weeks more mm -hmm. directly because mm -hmm. our poor mom was exhausted. Mm -hmm. She mm -hmm. couldn't take it anymore, mm -hmm. and at least I felt that I that I was with him, mm -hmm. that I spent more time with him, and mm -hmm. and uh, we tried to, all the children were together, and we mm -hmm. tried to let him know that everything was fine, that mm -hmm. uh, our mom won't be left alone, that we mm -hmm. were there for her. Mm -hmm. So those kind of uh, feelings really mm -hmm. help us a lot, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and hopefully mm -hmm. it helped him to, to live this world yes. in a better, Much. with a, yeah, mm -hmm. better mode. I'm sure that um, that he experienced that emotional support. Mm -hmm. You know, people even with advanced Alzheimer's really pick up on emotions. Yes, yes. they may not understand exactly mm -hmm. what's being said mm -hmm. or know how to respond, but they feel they're and like little kids. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so thank you for sharing and for giving us a lot of personal feelings about you. what you went through. Mm -hmm. So I know it's difficult, even though it's happened, a, oh, yes. you know, some years, a few years back. But it's still difficult to discuss. Mm -hmm. I think it's yeah. just very briefly. It's very po important that people look for help. There are many mm -hmm. resources mm -hmm. here, support groups by yes. the Alzheimer's Association, yes. by Stanford University. Right. So they, they, I really encourage them to seek for help, look mm -hmm. for help. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And actually, that's uh, what I would like. Larry to focus on next because I'd like you to help our audience understand what kinds of help are out there. You know, what do we have available here in the Bay Area, mm -hmm. uh, resource-rich communities here? What can people do if they're in this they're in this trajectory? They're going down this path. What kinds of help can they look for? Yeah. Well, like Selena pointed out, there's a wealth of resources in this area. Uh, and that offer a number of different kinds of services. Uh, we could start with support groups. They are mm -hmm. very common, probably the most common kind of service that's offered. And the Alzheimer's Association has a very highly organized program in that regard. And mm -hmm. people can call the Alzheimer's Association and find out where support groups are being held mm -hmm. and uh, how often they're being held. Mm -hmm. that sort of thing to see if they can pair up with one. Mm -hmm. and, and the Alzheimer's Association, some of the chapters also offer a, a, uh, a pro program called a Savvy Caregiver, mm -hmm. which uh, focuses on helping caregivers develop the kind of skills they need to do the kinds of mm -hmm. things that they need to do mm -hmm. to make sure that things go well in the care of their loved one. Mm -hmm. And so that's, a, that's another thing offered. Uh, uh, in our work for many years, we worked with the Coping with Depression uh, uh, program that started out about 20 years ago. And over the course of that time, uh, we, in doing research with it, we pared it down or um, abbreviated to a point where it was, it's now a much shorter uh, program, uh, intervention program, we call ACEs. And uh, this program is, is a, available uh, for people who might be interested in it. And uh, one nice thing about this program that it, it does uh, highlight the importance of uh, what we call resilience in terms of how that functions mm -hmm. to help mm -hmm. individuals develop the right kind of coping habits to uh, deal with all the stresses that come up. And then there's respite programs that mm -hmm. are offered in, mm -hmm. the, in the community. Mm -hmm. And many of these programs you can hear about from all, all the different senior centers in the area, mm -hmm. and that's, uh, those kinds of programs. So mm -hmm. uh, they are uh, readily available. Mm -hmm. And then we also, uh, if you have more interest in these types of things, there is uh, the, the Rosalind Carter Institute of Caregiving mm -hmm. in East mm -hmm. Georgia. They have, uh, it, uh, they have recorded evidence-based interventions all over the country so mm -hmm. that people could mm -hmm. look into those mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, thank you. That's a, that's quite a list. Mm -hmm. uh, what I would like uh, for either of you, if you could help our audience understand what is meant by respite. When we talk about a respite program, what are we really talking about? Well, that's... No, go ahead. That's, go ahead. A, that's a very good question. Mm -hmm. I, I should have uh, elaborated on that a little bit. It's essentially, it's essentially a type of program that can vary in terms of what it offers, but it provides an opportunity for the, the primary caregiver to be uh, laid off for a while and somebody else is taking the care mm -hmm. for a while so that they can have some free time to take care of their personal needs mm -hmm. uh, and do some mm -hmm. things for themselves so that they mm -hmm. can regenerate, get refurbished and mm -hmm. go back into the, mm -hmm. to the big fight again, mm -hmm. feeling a lot better. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, there are programs that, where you can get respite mm -hmm. for a half a day or a whole mm -hmm. week. It depends mm -hmm. on what it is mm -hmm. that you really need. Even the mm -hmm. Alzheimer's Association mm -hmm. offers that resource for the mm -hmm. caregivers mm -hmm. and uh, oh. they can go out, uh, let's say on Thursday afternoon. They know they got Thursday afternoon off, so they can get together with a friend, they can go mm -hmm. out shopping, whatever makes mm -hmm. them feel better. Mm -hmm. The thing is that to get them out of that stressful situation, mm -hmm. and that really helps them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering too, um, I've heard about adult daycare programs yes. and daycare mm -hmm. centers. Mm -hmm. I wonder uh, if either of you could help our audience understand what does that mean, an adult daycare program, and when might you want to use a program like that? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Doctor, after you. Well, uh, there, it, actually, adult daycare programs do offer, in a sense, a form of respite. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what a caregiver can do is make arrangements to bring mm -hmm. their loved one to an adult day uh, program where they are in uh, active in programs there at the adult day center mm -hmm. and they're under supervision for the mm -hmm. day mm -hmm. and the, the caregiver mm -hmm. can leave the person there and then mm -hmm. go take care of oh, other mm -hmm. errands and things they need mm -hmm. to do either for mm -hmm. themselves or for the, the, uh, the care recipient. Mm -hmm. They can go get medications. They can see their, their doctor if they mm -hmm. need to. They mm -hmm. can uh, do all kinds of things that are mm -hmm. important. Ideally, to yeah. take the time off, and I think it's very important, the support from other members of the family. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. mentioned that most of the time, women are the ones who are taking care of the person. Yes. But it's very, very important to know that uh, we need the support of the other members of the family. They can run errands. Mm -hmm. They can go and get the medication. Mm -hmm. So this person can really take some time off completely yes. mm -hmm. and get uh, more energy to go back to the very, very stressful situation. Mm -hmm. Emotionally mm -hmm. and, and physically, it's, it's extremely demanding. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's important that other members of the family come on board. I know it's painful for them and it's interesting to see how each member reacts in a different way. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. for yeah. us, uh, mm -hmm. our uh, Tita, our oldest si uh, sister, it was so hard for her mm -hmm. to see our dad in such a shape, bad mm -hmm. shape, mm -hmm. but she will take care of some ad administrative stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, we will mm -hmm. call our brothers, help us move in our dad on the, mm -hmm. on the, on the bed, even though he had mm -hmm. some uh, nurses' assistance mm -hmm. at the end because it was so heavy to carry him. Yes. Yes. You know, so, mm -hmm. but this is a family issue mm -hmm. that shouldn't be left to just one person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm very glad that you brought that up, that it is a family mm -hmm. issue. I think it, in the research that's been done primarily has focused on one caregiver that's mm -hmm. often referred to as the primary caregiver. Yes. And it's assumed that that individual takes on most of the work. Mm -hmm. And most of the research, uh, well, virtually no research, I should say, has been done really looking at the whole family, the family as a unit. You know, how has the family been affected? Yes. And what are some ways to bring the family together to help mm -hmm. them work together as a unit, you know, to, to mm -hmm. provide support to that primary caregiver, mm -hmm. but also to have their own role so that they feel, you know, after the person passes, they can look back on it and say that they did their part sure. as well. You mm -hmm. know, it's important. So. In terms of a future direction for caregiving research, I think that's one area that we need to develop, is how mm -hmm. to really assess the impact on the entire family. Because yeah. children are affected too, you yeah. know, when they see a grandparent 
food sure. that they yes. u maybe used to read to them yes. or do things with them, and then they no longer mm -hmm. can, and they mm -hmm. get frightened. Mm -hmm. What is happening to Grandpa, yes. you know, or Grandma? And uh, oftentimes the parents don't really tell them. Yeah. You know, they kind of shield. Yes. Uh, and so there's a lot of um, unknown effects on family members. Yeah, but it would be very healthy for them to also be part of that, to understand, mm -hmm. to explain them in a very simple language. What mm -hmm. is happening to grandpa, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. mostly, no? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Why he cannot play with you anymore. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there are arguments among the members of the family because of the stress and the pain that we are experiencing mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. our loved one. Mm -hmm. It's so hard to, to deal, we all deal uh, uh, with mm -hmm. our emotions in different ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Well, um, Larry, I'm wondering, is there any area for future research that you would like to suggest that the field uh, take up? Uh, well, there's an awful lot going on in a number of, of areas uh, with regard to caregiving itself. I think uh, Selena and you both have emphasized the importance of, of getting the family involved and learning more about how they can contribute. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also um, uh, room to work with psychologically with individuals mm -hmm. using some of the uh, techniques we use in cognitive behavioral therapy mm -hmm. to help help them learn how to deal more effectively with mm -hmm. uh, with uh, the one they're taking care of and uh, also deal with their own feelings and mm -hmm. uh, uh, their own behaviors mm -hmm. and uh, we have done some of that work uh, on an individual basis and on a group basis, and mm -hmm. uh, it's really quite quite effective. People can, in fact, learn how to deal mm -hmm. with these kinds mm -hmm. of problems. They mm -hmm. can become resilient mm -hmm. in a sense, mm -hmm. and we're very, very pleased with that. Well, well, thank you both. It's, it's, I think that's probably a good place to end right now. Uh, I really appreciate and want to express our gratitude to both of you for sharing your time and your expertise. Anytime. Thank and you. Uh, our, unfortunately, our segment is coming to a close, so I would like to end by inviting our audience to seriously consider volunteering for the Stanford Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. We need volunteers because we need the, the number of people, a number of people to participate so we can answer these complex questions. What are the causes of Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia? And most importantly, how can they be treated? So at our center, we're seeking people with mild cognitive impairment, early stage Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, or Lewy body dementia. And if you call the number that is on the screen, you will be able to get your questions answered. Maybe you will decide that you will volunteer, which would involve a longitudinal process. So you would have comprehensive examinations annually for as long as you wish to participate. And our center is unique because in addition to having this kind of evaluation and workup for the person involved, we also offer companion services for the family caregivers. So we hope that you will call, and uh, we hope to see you in the future. Thank you. <laughs>